All right, good evening. Good to see you. Hope things are going well. I know it's mid-semester and schedule a lot of times catches up with us, so we've thinned out a little bit. Certainly it's not because the teaching hasn't been exceptional. You never know. Um, so, uh, but tonight we are uh, covering an incredibly important uh, topic of depression. And whenever we look at the landscape of, of mental health in, uh, in the United States, uh, you're going to see it here in just a moment. The, the statistics of, of dealing with anxiety and depression are, are skyrocketing. Um, it's, it's the reason the, the alarm bells are going off in terms of a mental health crisis uh, that's occurring in our nation. Um, and not just our nation, it's, it's around the world. And so, uh, really important topic. Um, excited to have Tim. It's just Tim tonight. We don't get Miss Elaine. Um, I'm sad about that. Um, walk us through. Uh, remember to please write any questions that you, that you might have, so that we we can interact with them. And depression's going to take. Uh, it's going to take two. Uh, it's this week and next week. All right. So if you know or have someone that you want to pass this. Uh, teaching along to. By the way, we always record these and those are posted online so you have access to that. Um, and then uh, so you can have friends, family, uh, people that need to watch these online as we work through uh, depression. Uh, th there is an important disclaimer that, that Tim gives at the top of his uh, chart here tonight. And uh, um, I want to explain it like this um, just so we're, we're clear. Um, we are functioning in a really a pastoral counseling in a biblical counseling lane um, of mental health. And so as we are playing in that space, we need the freedom to be able to, to speak uh, freely and plainly uh, in our lane also recognizing that there are uh, medical doctors and professionals um, that deal in this space that prescribe medication and uh, look at mental health and various issues from, from different perspective. Uh, you need to hear me say, uh, because I, I've dealt with this a number of times, um, uh, you need to, to keep taking your medication and you need to keep talking to your doctor in terms of use of medication and uh, help uh, get help through professionals there. Um, I do believe that the Bible and the gospel speaks to all of these issues, um, but that medication can be a tool that's used in conjunction with, uh, alongside, and, and so th that I'm not even, we're not even here to give overall social commentary on the use of medication and all of those things, all right? You just need to hear uh, me and us say up front in terms of the lane uh, that we're trying to play in and, and to press through some of these uh, mental health issues and how you deal with them, okay? Um, so with that, let me pray and then we will get started. Heavenly Father, we love you and we love your word. We thank you for your son, um, your nearness to us, and uh, your presence with us. Uh, Father, as a church and uh, as a church in this culture, in the midst of a mental health crisis and, and seeing depression skyrocketing, uh, Father, we are in deep need of you and resources that come from you in the truth of the gospel um, to set us free as a people and as your people. And so, Father, I pray that you would begin to equip us as a church more and more in terms of being able to handle delicately and well uh, 
this space of dealing with mental health and depression and yes. anxiety. Um, and, and to be able to, Father, as a people, to be able to take those thoughts captive and to be able to, to bring them underneath the authority of Jesus Christ and, uh, and the gospel that sets us free. And so, Father, help us to think well and right um, about all these things, God. Uh, we lift this evening up to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, good evening. As Jason said, we'll tread lightly, but we'll stay in our lane. Um, let me just on a personal note just say, I, I, when I was a young Christian, probably 18, a dear friend of mine had struggled with depression for most of his life. And at this point, he was a really strong believer and he had to be admitted to a mental hospital. And I remember the feeling of just feeling so helpless. And after he got out, we had lots of conversations, but he was still trying to regain his footing. And I was, I was like preaching to him, like telling him all these great things that he needed to hear. And it wasn't helpful. And that one example with this particular dear uh, friend of mine, helped me early on to see that we can't walk blindly into difficult situations in people's lives and, and just start preaching. We have to understand the delicateness of it. We have to understand the, the depth and the complexity of it before we can actually be in a position to help. So what I'm hoping uh, to accomplish tonight is to help us understand depression from a very logical and practical perspective. I'm convinced that a lot of things that we struggle with, we do so because we're blind to it. We, we don't really know what, what's causing us to stumble, so we keep stumbling. And I'm also a, a proponent that once we see something, we cannot unsee it. So once we see what the scriptures teach about depression, it puts us in a much better position to navigate depression in our own lives, and then to walk beside other people who might be struggling and to be more compassionate and understanding. So as Jason indicated, I want to start with this disclaimer that we will be covering the topic of depression from a non-medical perspective. So there is a medical model that addresses depression. Uh, we are not stepping into that space. We are strictly going to look at it from a circumstantial perspective, which by and large, is uh, the biggest part of, of depression when it comes to that. Most depression is not medical, but some of it is. So most of what we deal with uh, is not medical in nature. It is, by and large, a mishandling of life's circumstances. But I want to walk through these things. You'll hear me repeat myself a few times, and that's intentional. So... We always recommend the people we're working with to see their medical professional. If they're presenting depression, we always say, you need to go and get a checkup, make sure everything's okay, because that's not something we're trained in. We are not equipped to do medical intervention, so we don't do that. But as Jason said, depression in our culture is a major issue. Uh, many people are diagnosed with clinical depression. And I want to quote from an article entitled, Depression Rates in U.S. Tripled When the Pandemic First Hit. Now They're Even Worse. That's the title of the article. Here's what we read. Depression among adults in the United States tripled in the early 2020 months of the global coronavirus pandemic, jumping from 8.5% before the pandemic to a staggering 27.8%. New research from Boston University School of Public Health reveals that the elevated rate of depression has persisted into 2021 and even worsened, climbing to 32.8%, affecting one in every three American adults. So those who study depression report that one out of every four women will suffer with clinical depression at some point uh, in in their life, and then one out of every 10 men 
And they indicate that the reason this number is lower for men is not because they don't experience depression as much as women, but men don't tend to admit when they're struggling. Any elbows going? Men, men don't tend to, to admit that they're struggling. So it is likely that men are struggling with depression uh, at, the same rate as, at the same rate as women. Here are a few examples of the things that usually contribute to examples. Stress, but not just stress, but the mishandling of stress. Uh, difficulty in personal relationships, especially if the person is conflict avoidant. Uh, medical problems certainly contribute to depression. Poor diet, lack of exercise, past trauma, uh, and genetic factors. These are just a few of the things that contribute to depression. Some of the greatest people in American history or in history have struggled with depression. Abraham Lincoln once said, I am now the most miserable man living. If what I feel were distributed to the whole human family, there would not be one cheerful soul on earth. To remain as I am is impossible. I must die to get better. President Abraham Lincoln. Uh, some of you are familiar with the great Charles Spurgeon, and it is well documented that he struggled with depression for months at a time. Here's a, a comment on Spurgeon. It is a matter of record that Spurgeon, who lived with various physical maladies, on more than one occasion was so overcome with feelings of worthlessness, depression, and despondency that he left his pulpit in London to go to a resort in France where he stayed for two or three months at a time. Often he spent days resting on the couch because he was so depressed, so fearful, and so despondent. One would have to ask, how could a man who was so familiar with the Word of God experience these bouts of depression? Another uh, renowned figure in history is the great Martin Luther, who himself struggled with depression. So everyone is susceptible to depression. There's not a person alive who is not in a position to become depressed at one point or another. Um, so I, I sort of, I was thinking this on, on the way here, when I think about how I got into this soul care ministry, I basically cut my teeth on the topic of depression because I was in a very deep depression when I could not find any answers from the psychological world. And the medication did not solve my problems. And so I set out on a search as a 30 year old pastor trying to figure out does the Bible have anything to say about this depression and, and can I find any kind of help in the scriptures? And of course, my answer to that was yes. And I still believe that the scriptures speak to this particular struggle. Uh, also, my dissertation was actually on the topic of how does anxiety and depression impact pastors who struggle with suicidal ideation. And it is well documented that pastors struggle with depression. Uh, they don't talk about it. Many of them don't have anyone to talk to about it. And the, the whole stigma of mental illness in the pulpit is, is an obstacle to some pastors. So I only say that to, to say that I am not unfamiliar with this topic, not only from scripture, but in my own personal life for whatever that uh, means. So if you have not personally struggled with depression, it may be difficult for you to understand what it's like for someone to actually go through this, this struggle. Uh, now, if you have not gone through depression, it doesn't mean that you cannot help someone who is depressed as long as you understand uh, what's going on and understand how you can interact with that person in a beneficial way. You may be tempted to say to that person, some very, give that person some very good advice, like, why don't you just decide you're not going to let this get you down? Like, why don't you just stop feeling sorry for yourself? How long are you going to just continue to refuse to do the right thing? And 
And these things might feel like the right thing to say, especially if you're a little irritated with the person. But I, trust me, it's, it's not going to help. It is not going to help. So the advice might be accurate to a degree, but it's not the best approach. People who are struggling with depression are more, most benefited by a compassionate, gentle approach, uh, an, an approach that does, seeks to understand what's going on in the struggle. So let's compare discouragement and depression because they are not the same. Discouragement means to dissuade, refuse, to forbid, or weaken, to resist someone and in fact cause them to become discouraged where they lose courage. The opposite of discouragement is encourage where we build someone up or we strengthen that person. I think this verse in 2 Corinthians 4, 8 gives us a really good understanding of the difference. Here's what Paul writes. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed but not in despair. And that word despair is our word for despondency or for depression. And so Paul is basically saying we are perplexed, meaning we are at a loss as to what to do. We don't know what to do next. We're, we're sort of trapped. But we are not in despair, meaning we are not without hope. So to be despondent, to be depressed by definition is to be without hope. We're going to look at that more uh, closely in uh, next week's class. But it seems like Paul is saying, you know what? Life is very, very difficult for us right now, but we have not lost hope. And so the person who is discouraged can actually be encouraged. It's not that long of a distance between those two points in most cases. But the person who is depressed is not just discouraged. They are in a much deeper and darker place where encouragement is not likely to, uh, I thought I had a slide for that. This uh, encouragement is not likely to bring someone out of depression because this person has sunk into what could be called a pit of despair or a pit of hopelessness. In Pilgrim's Progress, Christian uh, was in the slough of despair or despondency. And some have considered this the dark night of the soul. It's a place where you are in a very dark place. You're confused. You don't know what to do. Um, and as that state persists, a person gradually sinks deeper and deeper into depression. So... Depression tends to cloud a person's mind. It's like a mental barrier that can cause debilitation or a sense of powerlessness. And they, they feel like they, many people say, I just can't get up. I can't do that. I can't go to work. I can't do that. And, and you're thinking, well, I, you actually can. Why are you saying you can't? Uh, but for that person, this is a very, very real and powerful experience. Some people actually can function while depressed. And, and let me just, just point out that depression technically, if you'll let me explain it this way, depression is not an emotion, even though the de definitions we're going to look at in a moment point to it being a, a, an emotion. Depression, in its truest definition, is to push something down. You're depressing something. And that is the... That's a really good definition. It's a really good way of looking at depression biblically, that a person is being pressed lower and lower. So there is no agreed upon de definition for depression. The National Institutes of Mental Health define depression this way. It is a mood disorder that causes a persistent feeling of sadness and loss of interest. The National Association of Nathetic Counselors defines de depression as a debilitating mood, feeling, or attitude of hopelessness, which becomes a person's reason for not handling the most important issues of life. Uh, the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Dis uh, Mental Disorders, 
say that the characteristics of depression will include things like low mood or low interest, interest in things you previously were interested in, trouble concentrating, changes in appetite or sleep, feeling hopeless or worthless, thoughts of suicide. These are some of the symptoms of depression. But depression, as I said earlier, is more than sadness. It's feeling uh, deeper. It, depression can affect a person to the point where that they cannot function and, and, and do normal activities. I, I once spoke with a young man, a college student who was depressed for six weeks. He was in bed for six weeks and could not get up. He was on medication. He was under a doctor's care. He could not bring himself to get up and go to school. So that is uh, an extreme case for a young man, but that is not uncommon. Let me say a word about grief. We talked about grief last week, and we looked at how uh, grief and sorrow can lead to depression. We looked at Job's example, and you may remember Job had gotten so depressed in his grief that he wanted to die. He wished he had never been born. And that is the nature of deep depression. You just want it all to go away. You don't know how you could do this for another day. So it's, it's important to remember that sadness from grief is usually a temporary condition. Grief involves tremendous sadness, but not necessarily hopelessness. And we looked at this passage, and I'll read it again tonight. 1 Thessalonians 4.13, And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died so that you will not grieve like people who have no hope. So this word grief in this passage means sorrow, distress, heaviness. And so it is understandable that when a person experiences deep loss that they will grieve until they can adjust to their new normal. And that process may be different for everyone and there is no predictable path for a good grieving process. Uh, the, but some people get stuck in grief. They don't really grieve well. They don't face their new reality. They just don't want to face it. And for some reason they get stuck in grief and they end up in depression, sometimes for long periods of time. So depression, again, becomes an outcome of mishandling, in this case, grief. So grief can certainly lead to depression if it is not managed well. Uh, when depressed, a person's emotional world becomes very negative and he or she can become very confused. So it doesn't matter what you say, you try to pick them up, you try to encourage them, and it just, it doesn't stick because they are looking through a very, very negative and dark lens. So let's look, take a look at some common contributors to depression. One is medical problems. This could be organic. Uh, this could be a brain tumor, could be a uh, hormone imbalance, thyroid problems, could be an, any number of physical problems that would cause a person to become depressed. That would be a medical issue. Another common contributor to depression might be side effects from prescription medication. It could be that a person is mixing alcohol and medication. It could be uh, street drugs. It could be any number of things that are just side effects of medications. Again, that is not in our lane. But the third contributor that is common is what we would refer to as spiritual and emotional problems. And this would be things like guilt over sin, not handling uh, their own sin well, not being able to accept God's forgiveness. And they stay in this state of self-contempt. They can't let themselves off the hook could be past abuse. It could be any number of things that are spiritual and or emotional in nature. So the third category is where we're focused tonight. So let's look at some biblical terms for depression, depending on the translation you use. Some of these may or may not be familiar to you. 
But one of the words that we'll look at later is the word downcast. This is in Psalm 42 and 43. Um, uh, the other is despair, which we looked at in 2 Corinthians 4, 8 just a moment ago. Another common term is grieved or to be disturbed. And one of the references to that, as you may remember, uh, Hannah was barren, and this is first Samuel, and she couldn't have any children, and she was weeping and was extremely grieved to the point where she would not eat. And that's the description of uh, of grieving. Another is interesting. This is Nehemiah 2. This is when Nehemiah finally arrived in Jerusalem and Sanballat and Tobiah were, quote, exceedingly grieved that someone had come to Jerusalem to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. They became depressed because their plan was being thwarted by someone who was coming to seek the welfare of God's people. Another phrase is uh, your countenance being fallen. This is the example of Cain who was in depression to the point that he became homicidal and was able to kill. We're going to look at how anger might feed into depression. That was probably the case for Cain. And then the word heavy, uh, where uh, the, the best reference for this, which is a little silly actually, when you think about it, but for this man, it wouldn't have been silly. And this is a story of King Ahab who wanted a guy's vineyard. He wanted his vineyard, he loved that vineyard. And he went to him, he said, I'd like to have your vineyard. And Naboth was his name. He said, I'm not gonna give you the vineyard. He said, I'll, I'll buy it from you. He said, no, I'm not giving, you're not having my vineyard. Here's what, here's what Naboth said. Oh, I'm not tracking with my slides. It's hard to do this with half a brain. Here we go. So Ahab went into his house sullen and displeased, depressed, because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my father. And he lay down on his bed and turned away his face and he would not eat. Now this depression is rooted in greed, jealousy, self-pity. So this is not a medical issue, obviously. But this is an, another example of how something might contribute to a person being or becoming depressed. So here's some biblical examples that we could look at. Um, again, Cain's depression was rooted in anger and jealousy. Elijah, in 1 Kings 19, was rooted in burnout, physical exhaustion, uh, to where he wanted to die. His remedy was sleep and food. David, in several places, talked about his depression and how his was rooted in guilt over his sin, to the point that his body uh, was, he was having psychosomatic and physiological experiences because of his depression. Uh, the psalmist in Psalm 42, we're going to look at that again uh, in detail, was rooted in, in anger. Emotions were in control. We just looked at Ahab and, uh, and then Jeremiah, which we'll look at next week. Jeremiah's depression was rooted in confusion and his inability to accurately interpret the circumstances he was in. Paul referenced depression in uh, 2 Corinthians 1.8 when he writes this, for we do not want you to be ignorant brothers, brethren of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure above strength so that we despaired even of life. So that word despair means to be utterly destitute, to renounce all hope. So here's an indication that the Apostle Paul experienced some level of depression. We don't know what his emotional state was, but we do know that he was technically in a state of depression and had lost all hope for surviving. It's interesting, this word is only used twice in the New Testament, and it's both in the passage we just read here in 
2 Corinthians 1, 8, and in the 2 Corinthians 4, 8 passage where we read, we were complex, we are complex, but perplex, but we are not in despair without hope. So these are some of the biblical examples that we can find in Scripture. There are others, uh, but these do give us a really good uh, spectrum of what might be contributing to depression. So let's now turn to misconceptions about depression. And another disclaimer, I just want to re repeat that we are viewing depression not from a medical model, but from a circumstantial perspective. And I also know that I'm about to give you broad categories at the risk of offering you simplistic uh, answers or a simplistic uh, explanation. So I don't want to do that either, but I just want to help us understand a little bit better how to process what depression is. So one misconception about depression is that it is active and it overcomes me. I am passive and depression is happening to me. That's what it feels like. But that is actually not completely true. The truth is I passively allow depression to develop and occur. And so whether I know that or not, I am allowing this to take place and I gradually uh, am a participant in that process. Another misconception is that depression renders me powerless. Many people have, have said, I just can't do that. I can't, I can't do that. Don't, please don't make me do that because that sense of powerlessness is so strong. The truth is, it's not that I'm not, that I don't have any power, it's I choose to give up. I choose to give up because it's too hard and it's overwhelming and I give up my power. Another misconception is that depression is an illness, uh, that I have no control over it, that it is just, I, like I'm not doing anything, I'm just, I, am, I have this problem, uh, this illness of depression. And I'm very careful here uh, that depression is not necessarily an illness. Depression is usually a consequence of not managing my emotions appropriately. Now, let me just say this. It is possible, possible for a person to become so depleted in depression that they will become physically ill. Now there is controversy and has been for the last 50 years on whether or not depression is an illness. And so I'm not gonna step into that argument because I love to talk about it. And if I start talking about it, we won't get to the rest of these notes. So an another, another uh, misconception is that I am not responsible for my condition. This is a sort of a victim mentality. I am, I'm not doing anything. It's not my fault. And again, I'm being very careful. No, we don't want to place blame on a person. I don't want to place blame on myself or you to place blame on me if I'm struggling with depression. I don't think that's helpful and it, it doesn't accomplish anything. But at some point, the person who struggles with depression has to identify things he or she can become responsible for and begin to, to take action on those particular things. Another misconception, uh, or, well, the truth is I am responsible for my emotional state. Uh, that's probably a, an entire seminar that we don't have time for tonight, but there is a responsibility that falls upon us. We are not uh, powerless over our emotions. Our emotions come and go, but they are not to have authority in our lives. So we are responsible to manage those emotions. Uh, another misconception is depression is not a sin issue. And again, let me just state uh, that the person who is depressed is not sinning. However, depression is usually a result of some type of sinful reaction. So it's not that you're sinning by being depressed, which I wanna put that here. Depression is not a sin. 
that the, per the person who is depressed is not sinning by being depressed. So I want to be very clear. What we are pointing out is that there is probably, and I'll show this in a moment, probably something that some choices that are being made that are contributing to the depression. So let's look at how depression occurs because it often occurs when we respond inappropriately, sinfully, wrongfully to circumstances, people, and sin. This is a very, very important concept for us to understand. So let's look at this diagram. This diagram kind of shows a very simple version of how this might begin and progress. So something happens, that's the circumstances on the slide. Something happens and I have a sinful response to that event or that statement or that whatever that is. And I don't handle that well. So for example, I might get angry, but I don't want to express it, so I stuff it. So that, that's just one example. But in one way or another, I am not responding appropriately to that situation. And so if I don't, then I might end up experiencing some guilt, maybe some shame, discouragement, grief, sorrow, or any number of things. So I, now I'm in this state where I'm conflicted and I don't know what to do about being in this state. So I make another sinful response to my condition. And then it gets worse and worse and eventually I end up spiraling down into a state of depression. Uh, let me give you a, a simple example that I really can't relate to, so I hope some of you ladies can. Let's say that you don't receive a wedding invitation to your friend's daughter's wedding, but all of your friends receive one, but you don't. That's your circumstance, that's your event. And so you start wondering, hmm, that's, that's really hurtful. Like, I, I can't imagine why she would have left me out. I mean, I thought we were friends. Then you might get angry. At this point, you haven't done anything wrong yet. But, just, but you're stewing. You just can't figure it out. Like, why? Why would this happen? So you start imagining reasons why your friend would not have sent you an invitation. And now you're ind indulging in some, probably some pretty negative self-talk. And you're starting to imagine scenarios. You have no idea if they're accurate or not. But you start thinking, you know what? How dare she leave me out? Like I, I thought we were friends, but you know, kind of never really liked her all that much. And now for sure, she's gonna act like that. So, and you call one of your other friends and you say, can you believe she left me out? Like this is, this is just wrong. This is such a bad thing for her to do. And so the situation doesn't change in the circumstances, but it's changing within you. You're getting more and more upset. You don't know what to do. You begin to feel sorry for yourself. You might drown your sorrow with food or drink. Uh, and then you feel awful because you feel awful and you become depressed. You're not, you don't want to go anywhere. You don't want to go talk to your other friends because she might be there. Uh, and so Eventually, you just get exasperated and you decide to call her, kind of give her a piece of your mind, right? So you say, you know what? Can't believe you're an awful friend, all this stuff. And now you have sinned in your heart against her. You have sinned verbally and said some really mean and ugly things to her. And now you're just spiraling. You're feeling awful. Like something in you doesn't want to be this person, but yet you are being this person. And the more you misbehave, the more bad you feel. And now you're just in a state of depression. And then you find out that she actually did send you an invitation, but it got lost in the mail. And now you have all the shame of how you handled that. And not only does your friend directly know how you handled it, but those other friends know 
how awful you are too. And so now you have to humble yourself and apologize. And now you have to somehow build up confidence to get on an equal footing with these friends again, because you're such an awful person in the way you handle that. So this is just an example of how one progresses from one bad choice to another bad choice to another bad choice until you become uh, self-contemptible and you don't like yourself and you just don't want to fight anymore. You don't want to work at it anymore and you end up depressed. So this example shows us that not handling the original problem correctly can create more problems. And when we mishandle those additional problems, we create more problems, thus the spiraling down effect. Eventually, after an extended period of time, failure to respond correctly to problems cause us to give up and lose hope. We feel overwhelmed and hopeless. We end up paralyzed and unable to function, i.e. depressed. And so it's at this point that the symptoms of depression usually show up. You're not eating or you're overeating. You are not active. You, your thoughts are confused. All of the symptoms that will, will show up will show up here. And so I want us to look at Psalm 42 just quickly because I'm going to spend a little more time on it next week. But this is Psalm 42. The psalmist is asking a question. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. So it seems this man is, is thinking, okay, I am depressed, because that's what the, the phrase cast down means. I am depressed and I am angry. That's what the word disquieted means. But why? Why am I depressed? And then his antidote is, Put your hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance, his presence, uh, his nearness. So the question, why am I depressed, is a really good question. Especially if you understand that depression is a state of being, not an emotion. I am here for a reason. I got, there's a reason why I arrived here. How did I get here? And with this simple approach, we can, we can start asking really good questions. Could you look at, is anger rooted in this? Is, is this depression rooted in anger? Is it grief? Is it jealousy? Do I feel like a failure? Uh, is there something I feel like I deserve that I'm not getting? Once we begin to understand that we can't really solve depression by working on depression, the only way to really solve depression is to identify what brought us to depression and begin to work on that thing or those things so again, next week, we will look at how to reverse that process to come out of depression biblically and very practically, really. Uh, one of the things that depression seems to uh, do is, an, is an, it intimidates us. It makes us feel like I, this is way over my head. This is like rocket science. I, I don't know what to do with this. But when we begin to break it down and look at it, we see that there are some very manageable components that make up this huge um, obstacle that we have in our life. And the, the more we can understand what we are doing, how we are interacting with this process, the, the better position we will be in to come out of that. So if you'll allow me, I'd love to pray for you right now and then we can take some questions. 
Lord, we thank you that you know us. Lord, you know how complicated life can be for us. You know that we don't always know what to do. And you've told us in your word that if we lack wisdom, we should ask you uh, and we shouldn't doubt. We should believe that you're gonna give us the wisdom that we need. Wisdom is the application of knowledge. So Lord, you can teach us how to live out the gospel in these very difficult places in our life. And so we pray, Lord, that you would help every one of us as we face circumstances that uh, we don't know what to do about, that we would not just react, that, that we would seek you for wisdom to know how to navigate this, that we would not allow it to frighten us or to startle us, but that we would remember that you are with us and that you saw this coming before it ever arrived and you've prepared us for it, whether we know it or not. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you stay right here, buddy. Mm -hmm. Um, awesome. Uh, thank you, Tim. So you closed with the with a, a statement about asking your your soul the why question, right? And how did we get here? H have you found uh, people that are depressed can answer that question? Not, not immediately, but it's a good beginning. Yeah. How do you, uh, how do you coach through answering that why question? Be because, because those waves of depression uh, hit people because it, it, it takes them down for so long. Uh, it, it seems like the, how did we get here? The why are you downcast, oh my soul? Uh, yeah, if you can put your finger on it, then, then that helps out a lot. But w what are some simple tips of someone here of asking their own heart uh, the why, that why question? Yeah, and you're, that you're a week ahead. Of I'm me. a week ahead, okay. But some of the questions are, is there something that I'm upset about? Is there something that I have been upset about? Um, is there something that I that ha, has taken place in my life, but I have ignored it uh, and just prayed about it, but I haven't really dealt with it, never really addressed it appropriately? And usually there is something. Yeah. And uh, without trying to poke, you know, point that out, we don't point that out. We just ask the question. And usually there is probably one or a series of things that ha have taken place or are continuing to take place. Uh, they are multiple things. They've lost a job, they've lost a relationship, and then they begin to interpret that. that that's, something, that's saying something negative about me. What is that saying about? What's wrong with me? Because all these circumstances are telling me something's wrong with me. Yeah. Uh, you, you, you had a great list of some sinful tendencies that led to depression from Scripture. Um, uh, would you also say that uh, undealt with hurt or people sinning against you from the past can also lead to depression? Absolutely. And, and there's two components that when they couple together, they're powerful. That's shame and a victim mentality. And if you have a victim mentality, you feel like things are being done to you and you don't have any power, people are cruel and you can't defend yourself and you're ashamed of yourself and, and how you have lived or how you've conducted yourself, uh, those are powerful and they can drag you into depression pretty quickly. Uh, er, early on in the presentation, you, you had mentioned, I, I wrote it down here, uh, you had mentioned that people who are conflict avoiders can oftentimes deal, deal with, pression, with depression more. Uh, why is that? Uh, there is some research that has connected inverted anger with depression. So the person, uh, if you have a person who's just like, they just tell it like it is, you upset them and they're like, wow, they're right at you like my, 
like other people I know uh, and have known, uh, those people usually don't get depressed because they're like, they're after it. Because they let it out. But the person, especially the Christian who feels like, well, it's not nice to be, you know, to communicate like that because that Christians all do that. Well, the alternative is to stuff that and to act like it's not bothering you. And so you begin to stuff all this. It, and then you get angry, but you don't feel like you have the freedom to address it. And so you're, you, you turn on yourself and the anger is inverted but it starts to implode. And because you don't have an outlet or you don't give your permit, yourself permission to let that out, it, it drives you down into, press, into depression. Yeah, so, so you're saying that stuff's in there and it, it's working itself out in some form or fashion. Yeah. yeah. I'm getting depressed because I have a couple of questions. <laughs> some questions from the peanut gallery, Paul. I'm going to say I don't know. I mean, could could be, but I don't think there is a uh, you know a theme that says if you're an alcoholic or you depend on alcohol, then you must be depressed, or if you depend on alcohol, you will become depressed. I don't think that there's a you know anything that says these are connected. They may be, but I don't think it's across the board. That's my opinion. Okay, Jason. Yeah, great question. Um, it, I mean, the, 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 the scripture spoke with clarity in terms of what was taking place there. Um, uh, that said, as you work through the, the entirety of the Bible and you look at uh, the way that the enemy works in our lives, overwhelmingly it is through uh, lies and deception and uh in our thought life and uh, attacking us in uh, root identity questions and even in pressing upon uh, a lot of the things that we're talking about here in terms of undealt with issue, anger and hurt and, and a lot of those uh, symptoms and uh, issues internally uh, and then and then lying to you about them, all right? So he is a deceiver. He is the one who accuses us. Uh, he can no longer, I, I read Revelation 12 tonight, right? He can no longer accuse us before God and his throne, but that doesn't mean that he doesn't come and accuse us. And so overwhelmingly, what, what I have found in counseling situations is uh, the ability to, to put our finger on lies that we are believing and how, how to answer those lies with, uh, with scripture and, and to cut that off at, at that very beginning source. So I think you gave uh, a, a great practical example of didn't get invited to a wedding, all right? Um, having heard that scenario, uh, where and how do you fix that it domino effect along the way and, and where should you first uh, have stopped the sequence and how do you answer that? That is not what to do, Paul. Don't commit <laughs> suicide. Thank you. Wrong answer. All right. So, <laughs> so, so down front, uh, we heard she, she should immediately have gone and spoken to the person that didn't, didn't invite her to the wedding and dealt with that on a one-on-one -on -one basis, right? Um, let's say hypothetically she finds out that that person did not invite her, 
okay? Uh, and there's kind of hurt. There's a break in that relationship. How do you stop that hurt that has now occurred from spiraling into everything else that vomited out? How do you stop that? You self-disclose what the hurt is about in, in your life to the person you need to. And alcohol is a depressant for depressed people. Alcohol itself is, is a depressant. So uh, it, the short answer that I would give you uh, goes all the way to the very beginning in your understanding about your identity and your relationship with your heavenly father. You will have relationships and life that, that hurt you and break your trust and, and you have to work with those on a horizontal level. Uh, always the, the first immediate answer is to understand who you are in Christ. My identity, my worth, they are found in Jesus, not always in having great friends. Yes, Friends are good, and God wants us to have good friends, but when those go awry, it's not going to compromise who I am as an individual because ultimately my identity is in Christ, okay? Guys, that's the big boy and girl answer. That's the answer that will allow you to usurp any circumstance and, and situation. Ultimately, that's where your trust and your identity lies in to be able to overcome the waves of life, Okay? Easy to say for the preacher to work that out and to work those muscles out in your heart and in your life. Um, it, it's hard. It's, it's going to take experiences. It's going to take the, the Lord pressing some of those issues until you really grasp it and put your identity completely in him. That said, you're still going to falter and you're going to be taught this over and over and over again. So any other questions? Rick? Um, not, not particularly, um, but it, it is parallel with what I'm, okay. I'm sharing. It's just, it, it just didn't happen as quickly as I shared it tonight. <laughs> uh, I want to comment on Saul because Saul is a case study of a person who's caught in, in the sin cycle because he, he would misbehave, someone would bring it to his attention, he would wake up, so to speak, and say, oh, I'm sorry. And then when the moment arrived, he was doing it again. And he continued. He never stopped uh, until his jealousy and anger had become murder. I mean, it had you could see him being stubborn against the will of God. He would not surrender to what he should have done, and he kept pushing. Now, I think he, he's an example of how dangerous rebellion can be when we, ref, when we just persist in what we want, even when we're confronted. And uh, David never did go back to that house toward the end of, his, of that scenario. He, he went back. He did it again. He eventually put distance between him. And so it's a case study on the sin cycle. It's also a case study on how we can deal with people who are repeatedly offending and sinning against us and being cruel and violent. Well, Paul would ask, he would go after David, and then he would say, all right, David, he could have killed me. I sinned against God. And then he'd take the gun and go home. And then he'd get there and get all upset again and then go back out. Yeah. But so there were times when Saul would see his longness yeah, he had moments of clarity. He did. And then get even killed, but then fall off the wagon. Yeah, and, yeah, and the only see. thing I would add to this is is that uh, because you had, you had men, mentioned the spiritual warfare that was taking place, we would simultaneously say um, e even though there was spiritual warfare taking place, uh, Saul, Saul wasn't a victim. So Saul was no, he, was responsible he for. Out. Uh, what he was doing and the actions that were that were taking place. Oh yeah, yeah. we see the same thing in people today. Exactly the same thing. I agree. Any other questions? Go up front.
The question was, if you have a friend, a loved one, someone close to you that uh, you see them uh, starting to deal with depression, maybe they have grief or loss in their life, um, how could you encourage them to take some first steps towards getting help? Yeah, so I would go back to last week's class on walk, walking with someone who's uh, grieving because I would want to ex explore you know, tell me what's going on. Like, what's going on in your life? Be a friend, be supportive, be inquisitive, try to enter that person's world. And the more you understand, and just having someone to talk to is a tremendous benefit to that person because they're, they're in their own head. And so to have an objective person to talk to, that's a, that's, that could go a long way, just that, for sure. And then you've probably earned their ear to 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 suggest. Yeah, you could you could seeing, ask seeing like, a pastor, seeing a biblical how, counselor, like if they say, well, you know, my my brother in law, you know, said some awful things about me in front of our family at a family gathering, and I just I just can't get over it. Uh, then you might say, well, you know, how how did that make you feel? Like, can we talk about that? And, and just kind of give her an outlet. And, uh, and you might, if, especially if she's a believer, you might be able to say, you know, God understands our, our struggle. He understands our frustration, our anger, and how unjust that was. I wonder, what, like, what do you think he's wanting you to do? How do you think he wants you to, to address this? And just some simple questions like that, because you don't have to fix it. You just want to, give that person some breathing room and some the ability to, to talk about it and think about it. All right, we might have time for one more. Right. Yeah. So, so that's controversial among not just biblical counselors and uh, the therapeutic world, but that's, that's a little controversial as to whether or not that's a fact, a scientific fact. Go ahead and repeat uh, the question. Oh, I'm sorry. The, re the question is, uh, can I, I'm going to give it different words and you tell me if I'm hearing you correctly. Uh, is depression generational? Can I, can I inherit it? Is that yeah, and is is a genetic, uh, and so that's that's controversial. Uh, I think a lot from a biblical perspective, when we look at the sins of the father being passed down to the other generations, and I think a lot of mental and emotional struggles are modeled, and we we don't we we don't know any other way to deal with life except what was modeled to us. So I'm not. I'm not saying that never happens and there's not some physiolo physiological component, uh, but I think in most cases that needs to be taken care of medically, but I, but I think we have to, in most cases, look at, okay, I am a, an individual. I'm responsible for my own thoughts, my own life, and, and I can learn how to navigate these challenges without fearing that I will be, I'm going to be depressed somehow because my mom or my dad was depressed. I think that's something we need to, we don't need to accept that. I don't think that's necessarily uh, the truth. All right, let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening to be able to think about your word and the way that you speak to uh, Oh my goodness, just our mental health and everything that we deal with in life and the situations that are, are thrown at us um, and the way that we respond to them. And uh, in this evening, the way that oftentimes uh, our response uh, uh, creates 
uh, further habits and further response and really patterns in the way that we think, God. And, and uh, Father, I pray for us here um, that we would be um, tremendous friends and brothers and sisters in Christ to yes. walk near and close to those in our life that are struggling with uh, depression. And uh, Father, we pray for wisdom and how uh, to counsel and when to pass on to those with more experience. But Father, that you would also uh, use us as your hands and your feet. Uh, and Father, I pray for everyone here under the sound of my voice, God, uh, that may be struggling with their own um, depression and uh, anxiety and, and uh, thoughts and cycles, God, that hits them in, in waves. Um, and Father, I, I pray first and foremost that that they would have a clear picture um, of the gentle and lowly Savior, the one who is incredibly approachable and understands us beyond any other. Uh, no one understands us, and no one is more approachable than you, King Jesus. Um, and Father, I pray for clarity. Um, that why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Father, I pray that your spirit uh, would do his incredible work um, and begin to reveal to our hearts um, the things that we are arboring there. And uh, Father, when you allow us to put our finger on issues, God, with clarity, then, then your word speaks to them with truth and you set us free. And so, Father, I, I do pray for that uh, over everyone in, the, in this room, Father. I pray for, for courage to have uh, needed conversations um, about uh, these important issues. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.